So, ladies and gentlemen, excuse us for this um, start. We try to start again. My name is Falko Feldman. I'm working as senior scientist in the Federal Research Institute for Cultivated Plants in Germany, and at the same time as managing director of the uh, <laughs> It starts again, Manuel, it, it starts again. Manuel? Uh, we are online, I think. No? So let us now start with you, Saria. I'm not important in this game. So, Saria. Okay. Again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sarja Andonius. So usually people call me Anton. So I am from uh, the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, Research Center for Biology. And my uh, title of presentation is uh, Effect of Biopesticide Name Extract, Asad Dirakta Indica Treatment on Soil Biochemical Properties and Plant Growth Promoting Disobacteria. So if we uh, consider the using of pesticide right now, uh, people usually use pesticide in overdose so in youth mom. So it will be give a uh, negative impact. For example, from the soil pollution, kill non-target organism, reduce the bio biodiversity, maybe also create resistant pests, etc., etc. And we also already measure in the organic farming compared to a conventional one, that the organic farming uh, have a better uh, biochemical soil properties and also the biodiversity. So then we have to consider that we have to find another way to reduce the using of chemical pesticide. So there is an Indonesian language, belajarlah tanah kita sakit. So we should learn that our soil is sick. Our soil, our soil is not healthy. So we have to find uh, uh, another way. So there is a possibility to use this uh, uh, name extract as biopesticide. But of course, this is still chemical. Do this chemical also uh, give a, a negative impact for uh, soil biochemical property and uh, uh, PGPR, uh, beneficial microorganism? And if we uh, uh, consider about that, then uh, uh, we have to uh, care. So how is the uh, neem extract work? So this neem extract actually can uh, kill the pest. They can use as prevalent. They can inhibiting the appetite of the pest. And what is the active compound? And the active compound is esa directin from neem extract that they can uh, use as pesticide uh, active compound. And 
as I, I said before, what is the negative effect or what is the effect of this compound for uh, beneficial microorganism and also for uh, soil biochemical properties? Then we do some experiment in vitro and in, vi in vivo. As you see in this figure, as I try to test what is the effect of neem extract on the growth of bacteria. So we can see here there are three types of uh, response. First one is uh, strong inhibition. So this neem extract can inhibit the growth of bacteria. And the other one is that this neem extract can inhibit in medium uh, way. So medium inhibition. And the other one is there is no effect at all. So there is no negative effect from the growth of bacteria. And we already uh, measure 11 uh, isolate of bacteria. So these all bacteria are belong to uh, PGPR. And you can see here, there are uh, different uh, response that some are uh, sensitive. For example, this bacillus, they can inhibit it only by two, five percent, five percent and 10 percent. But this pseudomonas did not inhibit it at all. So they resistant to this name extract. So I would say that uh, name extract give different effect for beneficial microorganism. But uh, again, so we have to consider because maybe also they kill beneficial microorganism. And the second experiment is what is the effect of this uh, name extract in the soil biochemical properties? And we check, uh, we, we did uh, five treatment here, you can see here. So first one is control, control plus PGPR, control plus PGPR and pass uh, biopesticide name extract 2.5%, soil PGPR biopesticide 5% and 10%. And what happened then? So we can see here, uh, this name extract actually, there is no negative impact on the growth of bacteria in the soil on the population number. So if we increasing the concentration, even the number of bacteria also increase. And this is very uh, fit nicely with the uh, activity of the microorganism. So respiration rate. So the number is increased, respiration is also increased. So this uh, uh, confirm that uh, in this way, there is no negative impact. But if we see in the environmental activity, here is not clearly affected by name extra. So this is a post mono a stress enzyme, so it's kind of enzyme that can uh, solubilize P from uh, unavailable one to available, and then plant can absorb. So there is a not clear effect, but tendency that also reduce the activity of postpormon esterase. But if we consider with urease, the, the urease enzyme activity is absolutely inhibited by this uh, name extra. So I would say that this name extract uh, maybe uh, could be affect the diversity of microorganism. So some bacteria is affected, but some other bacteria maybe not. But in the case of enzyme activity, there's also negative impact. So these two uh, experiments, I would uh, give some uh, Conclusion that if we apply name extra, yeah, from this uh, uh, point of view, from the literature, this name extra already used widely in many country in, in different country, and but according this experiment, we can see that they can inhibit the growth of PGPR, this beneficial uh, microorganism, and also maybe inhibit the diversity. So maybe cause the diversity loss or something like that. And the third one, then this name extract particularly inhibited the soil urease enzyme. So inhibitor of urease enzyme. So again, so I would suggest that if we use, uh, if we apply the name extract in high concentration in long period, uh, we should consider, we, we should we take care 
uh, maybe we should combine with resistant PGBR, or we also apply ameliorant that we can support the growth of bacteria in the environment. This is our uh, uh, result, and uh, I hope from this uh, presentation there will be a comment or question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saria. <clears throat> I think your um, your results are very important. Um, they are showing that even biopesticides, how you call them, have side effects to organisms which are not really the target organisms of the application. You applied something against insects and tested a side effect in soil. Uh, may I ask you, how is your registration process of biopesticides in your country? Because all these side effects should have been proven before and should be a matter of the decision to register it or to um, restrict the application only to the upper plant parts, for example. Can you say something about this? Okay. Uh, okay. This is, uh, of course, we have to uh, study more deeply. This is uh, maybe just a very uh, preliminary study. But again, we have to consider. And regarding the regulation in Indonesia, actually, is regulation is very good, so very strict. But you know, the farmer, the people, sometimes they just break the, the regulation. So the people, uh, if we hear about biopesticide, then they, they think that it's absolutely safe. But as we see in our experiment, there is also some uh, like a, a negative impact. So again, I think we have to consider about the concentration, about the uh, 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 doses, how much doses we have to apply. And I think we apply this 2% is quite high. Of five percent, so we have to reduce, and maybe uh, we can uh, have a good result. So this is my comment. Thank you. The second point is that um, in soil, the relationship between application of azadirachtin and um, the PGPR is maybe different because of the interaction of the networks. So never forget that you have in vitro effects clearly showing uh, these effects and they are very important, but maybe in the soil, everything is different. And we probably learn a little bit more when we now in the next uh, uh, presentation, we'll see that someone tries to kill nematodes with it. But a further question is incoming. Um, have azadirachtin any side effect on the human body, and is this checked by you as well? Okay, uh, I have never checked it, but even some people use this kind of uh, uh, traditional medicine for human medicine. So uh, again, so we are talking about the concentration, about the uh, how to say the the, the doses. So uh, again, uh, I have no idea. Uh, how in the effect for the human uh, body, but uh, some people use it as a traditional med medicine. Another question is, which active ingredients are found in neem extract? This you already have uh, said, azadirachtin as active substance. Anything else? Uh, uh, we just... Uh, uh, get this sample from a chemical uh, laboratory and they did this uh, analysis and they, they found this uh, uh, active compound. So we don't know another active compound, but sure, maybe also another active compound. So again, that we have to study more deeply. Someone is asking for the mode of action of azadirachtin. Yes. Actually, as you said before, that is the target organism is insect, yeah? And in this case, our, our target is microorganism. 
So uh, I don't know uh, clearly how is the effect, but there is a, a report that if we apply this kind of uh, uh, name extract, they will uh, give excess a number of uh, uh, concentration of ammonium. So this very simple one. So if really this is a true ammonium, that's why this urease is inhibited because uh, ammonium is product of uh, urease. So that's maybe uh, still it's a question. So again, uh, we have to uh, study more deeply. Thank you. And the last question is, are there explanations for the selectivity of neem extract on bad microorganisms and not beneficials? <laughs> that is very nice question. And I also have this question. Yeah, as I show you. So Domonat somehow is very uh, resistant. Yeah, But Bacillus somehow is, yeah, they uh, less resistant. So again, so I, I really want to study this. Uh, and uh, maybe there is some signal, yeah? Uh, this uh, specification uh, active site or uh, active compound uh, for uh, a certain uh, uh, genus of bacteria or something uh, like that. Thank you. But to tell the truth, you did not uh, say something about specificity. And now we are coming to the uh, second presentation, which speaks about non-specificity. No one really knows against what neem is acting. And Janusz now is trying to, um, to apply azadirachtin um, against root not nematodes, if I'm right. Right? Right, uh, Janusz? Yes, yes. Hello. Let's start with your presentation. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, Can you hear me? Could be better, Janusz, a little bit louder. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to my presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to present about a part of my uh, PhD work, which is impact and the control of root knot nematodes in tomato production in Nepal. Some overview of uh, plant parasitic nematodes. Plant parasitic nematodes belongs to uh, phylum nematoda. They are simple, microscopic, sedentary, and obligate biotrophs. Around 4,100 species are parasitized to the plants, which cause around $157 million of annual losses. Plant parasitic nematodes have a special uh, needle-like structure called stylet, which, uh, with which they invade the plant roots. So root knot nematodes, including Melirigian species, are one of the most one of the most economically important plant parasitic nematodes. They are globally distributed. Uh, they have wide host range. Um, around 101 species have been identified so far. So they are difficult to control as they are intercellular in nature. Some uh, symptoms of root knot nematodes in the field here, you can see the uh, patches in the field and root gall formation from root knot nematodes in infested uh, roots are one of the major um, symptoms uh, seen in the below ground level and the microscopic view of uh, female and egg mass is produced. When we see the life cycle of root knot nematodes, the uh, second stage juveniles hatched from eggs in the favorable conditions invade the plant roots by the help of uh, stylet. Uh, the second stage juveniles en entered and migrate inter intercellularly in the vascular cylinder and find uh, um, <coughs> permanent feeding site called giant cells. 
giant cells uh, function as a sole source of food to nematode, uh, which results uh, J2s molt into third, fourth, and adult uh, afterwards. Uh, females uh, produce hundreds of eggs in a gelatinous matrix called uh, egg masses, which later hatch in the favorable conditions, while uh, male have male are very less active in the plant tissues. When we see the status of root node nematodes in Nepal, uh, uh, the research so far done is very limited. As per uh, report, 30% um, of, uh, it was stated that 30% uh, of um, losses in tomato production and plastic house, plastic tunnels in Henza district. And uh, there were chemical nematicides um, assembled to control root knot nematodes, but they are, were banned due to their high price and also hazardous nature to us, environment and uh, human health. Therefore, uh, we initiate to perform the um, experiment applying biological um, control agents uh, regarding to control root knot nematodes in the tomato field. So our motive of uh, our work uh, was to find the better management measures uh, to control uh, root knot nematodes in tomato field, which can be uh, safe to the environment and also beneficial for the farmers, and to investigate the effects of various uh, biocontrol agents for uh, management of root knot nematodes in the tomatoes. To start the experiment, uh, first of all, uh, the experimental sites were selected and uh, they were already infested by root knot nematodes. Two sites were selected. One was uh, Dhaukhel in Bhaktapur district and one was Nala in uh, Kavipalansok district. Uh, these sites were also uh, pocket areas for tomato productions. And for experiment, uh, randomized um, block, uh, complete block designs were uh, chosen where the treatments were applied randomly. And you can see the layout of the experimental field <clears throat> with the definite spacing as per denoted by the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and uh, Livestock Department, especially for tomato production. You can also see the layout of subplot with the uh, 45 centimeter of plant to plant spacing and 60 centimeter of row to row spacing. And each subplot contained about uh, 20 plants for treatment for replications. A Srizana variety of tomato plant was selected and sown in the nursery tray for with the mixture of cocoa peat and vermicompost in the ratio of one is to one. And before seven days before transplantation, the land was prepared as per the layout I described of, uh, before and the fertilizers uh, were applied um, in the field per plant, um, including macro and micronutrients. So after that, 35 days older um, seedlings were transplanted and seven days after transplantations, the treatments were applied. Mm. Uh, botanical, uh, biological, chemical and botanical um, treatments, um, pesticides were applied as per those uh, given here. These treatments include um, serenade A ASO, in which bacillus subtilis was a major microorganism, bioact prime uh, with uh, purpura cilium lilacinum as a major uh, microorganism, gilum, a chemical pesticide, neem, uh, botanical pesticides. One more treatment combination of uh, BioAct Prime and Serenade ASO, and there were uh, the control without any treatments applied. So most of the uh, data were taken at the time of uh, final harvest, but here we obtained the non-significant results in the initial stage and first harvest stage uh, of uh, for the plant height from both uh, sites. Whereas the uh, plant with application of serenade showed the higher significant uh, than others in the uh, results of the plant heights from both sides. 
which say that biology uh, bacillus subtilis as plant growth promoter rhizobacteria colonize uh, plant roots which enhanced uh, plant growth there were a uh, uh, disease assessment uh, parameters taken galling index um, which uh, which was obtained uh, following the uh, chart here range from 1 to 10 as per the condition of the roots here the results show the less uh, gall root gall formation uh, in the serenade bioact and bloom prime <clears throat> which was supported by the less number of eggs extracted from the roots by from of uh, respective plants similarly the results from uh, zhao health uh, showed the less uh, root uh, gall formation followed by velum but not in the case of bioact and also supported by the number of uh, eggs for root system the data from uh, total yield showed high significance in comparison with the control from both sides, uh, from both um, all the treatments from both sides. However, the serenade ASO showed highly significant in Zaukel, which supports the bacillus subtilis showed high potential in increasing yield. So, in conclusion, the lower for, uh, performance of combination of serenade and bioact uh, might be due to uh, competitive and other types of antagonism between um, organisms themselves in the rhizosphere. Serenade ASO containing uh, containing bacillus subtilis promoted the vegetative plant growth and yield. However, other treatments were less successful in supporting plant growth. Serenade ASO showed a maximum suppression of egg production and reduced root gall formation from root knot nematode in both experimental sites. Therefore, serenade can be the good alternative in suppressing suppressing the uh, root knot. Uh, suppressing root knot nematodes. On the other hand, um, the results obtained from bioact velum and neem against root knot nematodes were vary in both sites regarding the parameters taken uh, which trigger for further investigations so lastly i want to uh, thank uh, professor dr florian grunler for his um, supervision and professor dr gopal bahadur kesi for his supervision in nepal uh, central laboratory uh, department of plant pathology in nepal all the uh, farmers and master students with whom I work, and all the colleagues and members of molecular phytomedicine in the University of Moon. Lastly, I want to thank uh, Tropenthal 2020 for the opportunity to talk. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Professor Gopal. Thank you very much, Yenish. I can't see me. Yenish. So I can't see me. Okay, I can't see you, but uh, doesn't matter. Um, Janusz, a stupid question. Ah, you have to, to leave the uh, presentation models, please. Sorry? You have to leave your presentation models. I have to uh, stop the sharing. To Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. So, a stupid question uh, at the beginning. Are all the tomatoes in Nepal grown in greenhouses? No. Um, there, were, uh, there are uh, um, areas, it depends on the areas where the tomatoes are grown. So, somewhere in the uh, areas like in the flatlands, like Tarai region, it's very difficult to build a greenhouse from the plastic and bamboo uh, because of the um, climatic structure there. So, they avoid greenhouses. But in the hilly areas, uh, greenhouses are very popular, like plastic tunnel houses, not exactly greenhouse like here in Germany. And the varieties you uh, choose were such which are grown without greenhouses 
normally Mixed as well. Mixed greenhouse. No? That is uh, the variety I chose was uh, made for greenhouses and very popular among the farmers in the hilly areas. Um, but for the flatlands, like in Thorai region, uh, for open areas, there are different type of uh, hybrids uh, popular. Okay, the first question coming from the auditory is uh, what biochemical changes may happen after invade nematode into cells? Do they produce any toxic substances? Have any self-defense mechanisms of uh, uh, tomato plants occur? Okay. Well, it's not directly a question uh, to your observed effects, but yeah. what uh, I think the auditory is still thinking about how is such an active substance like neem working? Why it is now good to pr to apply neem against nematodes? And uh, yeah, neem against nematodes. Now the question the question is, um, for example, for example, neem neem is a neurophysiological agent. So every, everything, every body who has nerves can be in any way um, in, uh, influenced by uh, this neem product. And we have to find out which range we need to, uh, to have effects of this neem in one organism or another. And the side effects which Saria described um, show that even Organisms which have no nerves are influenced by this neem. So this is a very important uh, question. And you raise now a very comparable uh, situation. You observe fungicides which have effects against nematodes. Yes. So therefore the auditory is asking, how can this occur? How can fluor fluoperam effect uh, uh, um, nematodes. Tuluparam is, uh, is also the chemical nematicides which, um, treat, uh, which parasitize the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, parasitize the eggs to, uh, which parasitize eggs not to hatch and also parasitize um, not to be uh, active to um, invade the roots. Yes, you are right. Um, if something is called fungicide, it is not necessarily only a fungicide. It's only because of the registration process called fungicide. And this uh, makes it absolutely necessary to test it mm -hmm. in a broad spectrum of organisms because it is, it is normally not very specific, and therefore you can observe such effects. So what happens when a nematode is uh, entering a plant cell? Can this be inhibited by uh, the substances applied? That's the question of the auditory. What happens when a nematode enters a plant cell? Can your substances which you uh, tested mm -hmm. in any case influence the entrance of the nematode or change the uh, physiology of the plant cell to, um, to optimize this uh, protection effect? So uh, basically in the case of uh, bacteria, so bacteria colonize the uh, plant roots, which prevent uh, again, uh, these uh, active nematodes to invade the plant tips, which also um, promotes the plants to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly with uh, bio, bio act, these um, fungus, uh, they are egg parasite um, fungus. They are more um, make the eggs 
less active to hatch and they can be used um, they 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 can be used multiple times but um, in my results so uh, bioact uh, the results are very very from sites two different sites so we can we need to even uh, study more about the mode of action of this fungus thank you another question is coming from the auditory Are there any trials done on root colonization by Bacillus subtilis in case of MI gene presence in the host cultivars? Uh, I have not done, but I, uh, maybe there are some experiments gone. Uh, I have not been so detailed in it, but I have not done with uh, this MI gene presence uh, experiment. It basically, the one uh, we performed uh, experiment is has no mi gene that was the hybrid from nepal and we did it in nepal so in the greenhouse also uh, we tested but uh, it was not mi gene present so we okay. wanted to do that one as well but uh, time because of this time limitation so we skip this one right. so thank you very much for presenting your results Janish. Thank you so We are much coming now to Angeline Chepkenboy from Kenya. And I ask Manuel to start now the presentation, which we already have. And we have the chance to ask you afterwards live. Manuel, are you there? He is. Good afternoon. Evaluation of selected common bean genotypes for their reaction to the Gabonas Campestus Fashola for straining bean production in Omega County, Kenya. I'm Chip Kimberly Pangolo, together with Dr. Gun Mengi and Dr. Shane Dior from Kenyatta University. Introduction Common bean Fashola Svargaris is nutritionally and economic. Economically important food crop grown around the world. Bean production has been declining in Africa, although they are the most affordable source of plant protein. In Kenya, declining bean production is associated with certain fertility, pests, diseases, and unfavorable weather conditions. Uh, these biotic and abiotic stresses are also factors that have been to affected bean production in Omega County. Statement of the problem. The common bacterial blight disease is caused by Anthemonas campestus fasciolite, which greatly affects the common bean. Uh, currently, there is no research or there is no documentation of any research that has been carried out to determine the resistance of any bean variety to common bacterial diseases. Uh, depletion of soil nutrients, which is attributed to rapid population growth in Kakamega country, has contributed to low productivity of the beans. It is therefore important to screen the available bean genotypes for their resistance to common bacterial diseases, as this will improve the common bean production, uh, increase the yield. Uh, also, it will also act as a source of income improve the nutrition and the health of the people of Kakamega County. The hypothesis of the study was that the inoculum collected and cumulated for migratory domain lab is not relevant. The bean genotypes in Kakamega County are not resistant to common bacterial diseases. Uh, the objectives of the study were one to assess the prevalence of Sandominus campestris specialized on bean genotypes in Kakamega County and to evaluate selected bean genotypes for their reaction to common bacterial blight disease under greenhouse and field condition. The study materials and method. Uh, the study was carried out in Kalio Kakamega, which is located in Kakamega County, in the western part of Kenya, as indicated in plate one. So this is the map of Kenya, 
and uh, the specific part where the research was cut. Evaluation of selected common bean genotypes for their reaction to the carbonous compestors for sure for straining bean production in Omega County, Ken, and Chipkinway Company, together with Dr. John Mengi and Dr. Shane Dior from Kenyatta University. <laughs> Introduction Common bean fasciolus vulgaris is nutritionally and economically important food crop grown around the world. Bean production has been declining in Africa, although they are the most affordable source of plant protein. In Kenya, declining bean production is associated with certain fertility, pests, diseases, and unfavorable weather conditions. Uh, these biotic and abiotic stresses are also factors that have greatly affected bean production in America. Out. Statement of the problem. The common bacterial blight disease is caused by Anthemonas compestus fasciolae, which greatly affect the common bean. Uh, currently, there is no research or there is no documentation of any research that has been carried out to determine the resistance of any bean variety to common bacterial blight disease. Uh, depletion of soil nutrients which is attributed to rapid population growth in Kakamega country, has contributed to low productivity of the beans. It is therefore important to screen the available bean genotypes for their resistance to common bacterial blood disease, as this will improve the common bean production, uh, increase the yield. Uh, also, it can also act as a source of income, improve the nutrition and the health of the people. Angeline, would you try? We we uh, couldn't understand anything. Would you try to present it live, Angeline? Okay, let me try. Can you hear me? You hear me? Yes, you have can to. Can you hear me? Yes, oh. we can, and you can. Uh, you should. Um, open your presentation and then uh, provide us with, uh, uh, share the, the monitor, please. Okay, sorry for uh, a lot of selected common binion types for the in Kenya. has been declining. Hello. Uh, bean production has been declining in Africa, uh, although it is the most affordable source of plant protein. And in fact, it is usually called the meat of the poor. I can be introduced by factors that are a statement of the problem. The common bacterial uh, blight disease is caused by Santomona campesus fasciolae and has greatly affected the bring beef production. Uh, it mainly it is mainly associated with the declining meat production in Kenya and also in uh, Kakamega County. Currently, there is no record of any or any documentation of uh, any site that, that any site that has been done in Kakamega County uh, of any plant that is resistant to common bacterial blight disease. It is therefore important to screen the available bean genotypes for their resistance, as this will greatly improve the income, the yield of uh, the beans in Kakamega County which will also improve the nutrition and the health of the people of Kakamega County.
Okay, the objectives of the study were one, to assess the virulence of Xanthomonas campestris pascholi in Kakamega County, and two, to evaluate the uh, to evaluate the selected common bean genotypes for the reaction to Xanthomonas campestris pascholi under the greenhouse and the field conditions. Uh, the study materials and method. This study was carried out in Kakamega, uh, Kalo Kakamega, which is located in the western part of Kenya. And as by what you can see in plate one, uh, this is the map of Kenya. This is the map of Kenya. And uh, Kakamega County is located in the western part of Kenya. So this is where the research was done. Uh, the research materials are mainly the, the, bean, the, bean, the, the nine bean genotypes were obtained from Caldro Kakamega and being released to the farmers. Uh, the source of inoculum, as we, uh, what you can see in plate two, uh, the source of inoculum were infected bean leaves, which were isolated during, they were randomly selected uh, from the farmer's field and from the Caldo Kakamega during a survey. So you can see that in these leaves, they are showing the symptoms of CBB. Uh, for, to, for the isolation of the bacteria, normal pathological uh, practices were done. And uh, this is part of the pathological process that was done for the isolation plate three. Uh, after this, the, the isolate were purified, they were characterized, uh, and some of the characteristics that were carried out of the gram stain and the morphological characteristics. Uh, pure colonies were maintained in neutral, in neutral agar in the lab at, uh, at the, uh, temperature of four degrees, which would be used uh, uh, for further uh, in, the, in the experiment. Now, during the experiment, uh, it was, the experiment was done in the greenhouse and in the field. Uh, in the greenhouse, uh, the potting material was a, a mixture of uh, sand, uh, soil, and uh, manure. Uh, uh, the, the soil that were, were used to fill the pots were obtained from, uh, from Kakamega Forest. Uh, part of this mixture was uh, steam sterilized at 21 degrees, uh, and the control for, for that was that the soil was not uh, steam sterilized. Uh, in, the, in the farm, the normal farm practices were carried out. Uh, including the preparation of the field, uh, uh, the clearing of the field, and uh, the and the weeding. Uh, for that, the data that was uh, collected included the uh, the the CBB score. The CBB score was done using the Seat scale of one to nine, uh, where one was the most resistant showing very few symptoms, and the nine was the most acceptable. Uh, to obtain this, uh, the to obtain this, uh, the plants were assessed from day 14, that is after inoculation, uh, with the with the inoculum. And what happened was that uh, other um, growth and uh, yield parameters were also assessed, including the plant height. Uh, the number of pods per plant, the number of seeds per pod, the length of the of the pod, and also the overall field weight. Uh, what happened was that uh, the after inoculation, that is 14 days after planting, uh, these symptoms were assessed weekly between uh, 21 days and the physiological mat maturity. Uh, when you look at this, uh, these are the results, and this plate six shows uh, the arrangement in the in the greenhouse. So the, of the nine bean genotypes that were planted, they were, they, they were randomly uh, placed in the, distributed in the, in the greenhouse. And the assessment was done to compare or to see the effect of CBB on the growth and the yield parameters. So you can see from this that uh, the, 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 the field and the, and the greenhouse experiment were almost in agreement, but that, that was in a place, no significant difference between the field and the, the field and the greenhouse experiment. As you can see in table one, table one tries to give us the results that were obtained from the greenhouse, and the common bacterial blight disease affected the, the plant height, where when you compare the when you compare the 
been plants that were inoculated with those that were not inoculated, the ones which were inoculated were significantly recorded significantly lower growth parameters as and yield parameters as compared to the ones which were not inoculated. So we, we can uh, from the experiment, you can also see that uh, common bacterial bite was significantly high. They have been fed compared to those that were not inoculated. And this result, we can, I don't, this significantly high is the bean plants that were inoculated compared to those that were not inoculated. Also, in the field, uh, the common bacterial bite diseases affected the, uh, the growth parameters, for example, the height, which was significantly lower in the inoculated than in an inoculated. And the other uh, yield parameters, including the number of seeds per pod, uh, the number of pods per plant, and the pod length. It was also seen that uh, there was significant interaction between the treatment and the, the genotype and the treatment. The research concludes that the Anthomonas campestris washali was confirmed to be present in the leaf samples that were collected. And there was a significant difference between the inoculum that was isolated from the farmer's field compared to the ones which are isolated from uh, the research station. Out of the nine genotypes that were screened, uh, the two genotypes, CAL77A and CAL156A, were seen to be tolerant based on the CBB score. Uh, it was also noted that uh, common bacterial blight disease caused a lot of losses in terms of qualitative and quantitative. Uh, the research recommends that uh, there's need of, to further evaluate other isolate of Santomalas campestris fasciolae, those that are known to be present in Western Kenya. And it is also important to establish the causes of tolerance in CAL77A and CAL156, so that this source of tolerance can be uh, introduced to the other susceptible bean varieties. I want to thank Kenyatta University, where I do my studies, Kalro Kakamega, where this research was done, and my supervisors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angeline. Please leave the presentation models and please, please um, let us see your monitor. Um, Yeah, wonderful. Okay, uh, Angeline, you, you mentioned a very important aspect in IPM, the selection of varieties, and that's um, of major importance, I think, because with the selection of varieties, everything starts. If we have varieties which are resistant against disease, we do not need so much uh, plant protection products and so on. Mm -hmm. Where did you get these uh, varieties from? Are these varieties from your country or where do you get normally this cull uh, varieties? Yeah, yeah, we got to the, I got them from uh, our country, Kenya, mainly from the Cal Rokakamega Jump Plasm Collection Center. Hello. I can't get you. My fault, sorry. Um, are these cultivars land races or are these highly selected races, uh, cultivars? I can't get you, get. Normally, um, I... you cannot hear me or you cannot understand me. Uh, normally the selection of cultivars starts with heterogeneous material which is not uniform. Yes, I, I cannot hear. Ah, okay. So let me chat with you. Now you can read the chat, no?
Can you read it? Did you read the, the message? I fear there's no communication possible in the moment. Uh, uh, let me, let me. Yeah, I have a problem with the network. I can't, I can't hear you. Mm. Okay. So, so thank you again. And uh, we will go to Charity uh, Vangiti and she will now conclude our session with her presentation and will speak about fruit flies. Charity, your turn. Charity, could you open your presentation and share your monitor with us? Yes, she can. Oh, Charity, we cannot hear you. There, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Charity from Kenya, uh, working for ISIPE. Uh, and my study is about the bango fruit fly. So this work is uh, done with Beatrice Morethi and Raphael from CIRAD. And uh, the problem is that uh, mango is very important in Kenya, contributing uh, a lot in terms of fruit exports. But uh, currently, though the area under production is increasing, we find that the productivity is not going up. Uh, and the key challenge identified is the pest and disease. The specific pest, um, say the mango seed weevil, the fruit fly, and the arthropod disease, but of key interest here is the fruit fly or the Bactrocera dosaris, if you like the scientific name. And if you can see from my image, the Bactrocera dosaris, normally the female lays egg on the mango fruit once they are ready, they're almost ready for ripening. And then they cause fruit rotting, sometimes the fruits drop. And the bad thing is that these fruits become uh, of less market value or attracts, uh, attract very bad prices. And the farmers normally react to mitigate the losses. Farmers are always rational and will act. So most of them react by using the pesticides, as research has shown. Others will use their own innovations, like for instance, uh, the, the previous presenters talked about the neem extract, their own innovations. There is also the use of the integrated pest management, which scientists have continuously advocated for. So the greatest uh, results normally is the pesticide. And the pesticides, uh, they cause higher cost of production, they have adverse health and environmental risk. They also cause market loss, especially to the EU, where there is phytosanitary requirement of the maximum residual level, which the exporters must meet. And then they also cause the research and development costs, which normally we don't look at when you're looking at the effect, the external cost of pesticide use. So, um, ISIPE has continuously advocated for integrated pest management and currently they have five components which they have, uh, they have disseminated. That is the use of mat, the male and hilter technique, the use of fruit bait, biopesticides, parasitoids and orchard sanitation. However, though the dissemination happened close to a decade ago, you find continuous adoption has been going down. For instance, uh, a study done in 2016 showed that adoption was as high as more than 60%. Currently, you find farmers have started living, abandoning this, this IPM. And the question is, are they are finding other alternatives that fit their dominant systems? Or is it that IPM is not fitting to their farming system? Or has the knowledge and perception or attitude changed over time? about IPM or have they come up with their own innovations? So this is what the study was mostly interested in knowing. And the conceptualization was that a uh, farmer will not adopt, a will not leave a technology if the utility they're gaining from that technology is higher from the utility they, get, they will get by leaving the technology. And so my conceptualization as shown um, in this equation here is that uh, if the latent benefit of using a technology is more, 
than that of not using is more than zero, then the farmer is likely to be an adopter. And a farmer will be an, an adopter if the latent benefit gotten from not using is, is, uh, is greater than a zero. And the disadoption stage will only come if someone adopted. That is to mean if a farmer adopted IPM, then they can be a disadopter. But if they never adopted, then they'll not be disadopted. So you find most studies have been um, doing adoption studies, not, not including this adoption like a sequential analysis. So this study followed a sequential analysis by doing adoption and disadoption in two stages as shown in the empirical framework. And uh, we used uh, bivariate probit with sample selection and also observed, observed for partial observation. This is because you find sometimes the unobserved variable uh, characteristics of the adoption could be related to the unobserved characteristics of the disadoption. So the study area was Embu County. Embu County is representative of Kenya and it's where the first uh, IPM advocation of the African fruit fly program started. And uh, these farmers have continuously been trained on IPM. Then uh, the study followed a two-stage sampling technique that's we identified embu purposively. Then we followed with the farmers, farmers list which have been used from the Ministry of Agriculture and we identified a list. Then uh, data was collected using uh, the, the questionnaires uh, created in CS Pro template and analyzed using CIS data. So the results show that um, for adopters, non adopters, and disadopters, you find that the losses due to fruit fly is quite high for the non adopters. And the other thing is that 98% uh, uh, were said that fruit flies were a major threat to mango productivity. And all of the farmers, sampled farmers, could identify fruit fly as a a cost of mango losses. And uh, again, 90% of the farmers said they use pesticides as a result to manage the mango fruit flies. So on different management practices, you find um, we ask questions on what management practices they have been using. And if you compare their knowledge and their use, you find that the knowledge about the IPM is quite high or other non-pesticide management practices. But when you come to usage, you find the usage has gone down. So the question is why? Then other innovations like um, other knowledge, like when to lay the traps, the, the fruit fry traps, you find most of them were laying the traps almost next to the ripening stage. So you find maybe the fruit fly have already, have already infested the fruits. So according to the ideal, ideal time to lay traps, it should be maybe two months before the, the fruits are ready, but you find their knowledge the knowledge indicates that farmers don't do that. Again, on replacing the lures, that is the, the, the active ingredient, the methylibna, you find the farmers still replace this after the season is over. So they'll only replace once the season over. So the efficacy of these um, traps becomes less. On farmers innovation, this one was uh, very interesting for me, uh, though I did not explore in finding out the active ingredient, you find that farmers have resorted their own innovations. For instance, the use of great green, green herbs like the Tithonia, pepper, Mexican marigold. You also find uh, things like neem extracts. You also find that they have modified the previously taught innovations like the food bait. They would now combine uh, uh, let's say molasses with an insecticide and use it like a food bait. So this, this, the drivers to this kind of innovations was mostly on lowering the cost of production, and then they would get maybe more income because there would be less losses, or the buyers would even prefer the fruit which have not been sprayed with synthetic pesticides. And again, also they were aware of reduced health and environmental risk. And then the major channels which they would learn this technology would be through the fellow farmers and their own in innovation, their own idea. So you can see uh, the photo, sh they are showing that there is also modification of the original traps. Traps is the most uh, commonly available at IPM component and also commercialized. So we use these as a proxy to, for IPM in this study. So you can find uh, the original traps maybe were designed in terms, they were yellow or they had different structure, but currently the farmers used their own containers and they would only buy the lower inside. So this one would save them even more than 40%. So you can see that uh, the driver for that innovation. And then uh, 
to estimate what factors uh, leads to the current adoption, I did a probit analysis. And you can see uh, gender uh, had an influence on adoption, on the current adoption uh, with 1% uh, significance level. Also, if someone attended training and uh, contact with the extension officers. So you find the social networks uh, have a great influence and also gender has a great influence on adoption of technology. Uh, to further analyze the adoption and an adoption disadoption now category, the sequential analysis with the bivariate probit, you find that household size is negatively in, uh, influencing disadoption. So maybe when a household size is, is more, they might be providing, you'd expect them providing more resources in terms of labor. But again, you might think that they, they need more more food, more resources for education. And so they'll channel their resources to other, other, other things other than IPM. Then you come to mango farm size. If someone had more lard, they are likely to, to adopt. Then you will also find uh, knowledge. If someone had knowledge, someone had good practices on non-pesticides, uh, training of uh, attendance of training, the contact with the extension officers, they were also likely to be uh, adopters than just adopt. Then you find that the correlation between adoption and adoption was significant. This shows that if we did a separate probit estimate, the results will not, will be, not, will not be efficient and therefore justifies the use of bivariate probit with uh, partial observation and sample selection. So uh, the conclusion and the policy recommendation is that you find that use of synthetic pesticide is a major result for farmers, despite the extensive campaign for IPM. And also the knowledge and the practices shows that though the farmers have knowledge, their usage is very low. So maybe designing a, a crop uh, strategy which incorporates all stakeholders, you find sometimes the development partners are interested, but if other stakeholders like the government does not own up the, the innovations and continuously synthesize the farmers, you find that these innovations end up not being, uh, having much impact on the economy. Again, uh, on the grassroots innovations, uh, we recommend scientific assessment of this and trying to find what active ingredient is, is in neem, what active ingredient is in tithonia, and maybe scale up such innovations to manage the mango fruit fly. Yes. Thank you so much. So, yeah. I would like to thank the ECP co-funders and also this project was funded uh, through the national government and the Swiss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charity. I have uh, one question, um, which, which uh, or something was not very clear for me. What would your definition of IPM be? Um, is chemical uh, use of chemical pesticides belonging to IPM or not? Uh, IPM, uh, very minimal use of pesticides. I would say very minimal use of pesticides such that to make sure that the economic, you don't go beyond the economic threshold. So if the use of chemical pesticide is there, it's very minimal, only when it is necessary. Yeah, this, it seems that you are using IPM as a, a strategy which contains a, a lot of different elements and finally the use of pesticides as well. So this, 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 the, the ECPA component, for instance, the use of the, the male anhelic technique, we use the methyl eugenol with the insecticide. This insecticide, it's, it's, it's just to kill the, the fruit fly once it, it is attracted to the trap. So it's very minimal use of insecticide if need be. For instance, the, the biopesticides, for instance, the, the food bait, uh, they only use the insecticide that would not harm the fruit to target the adult or to target the pupae. Yes, but ag again, is for example, the presentation of Angeline, the cultivar selection, part of IPM for you or not? Pardon? Is the selection of cultivars part of IPM or not? Is cultivar selection uh, something which is belonging to IPM? 
I'm not getting that. I'm not getting that. Yes, I have the impression in all presentations that uh, we are speaking about different things if we are only using the abbreviation IPM. The IPM in Europe is every time a composition of different elements and all together from cultivar selection to pesticide use is named IPM. Mm -hmm. If we are now uh, starting to separate this, um, this uh, definition of IPM into different parts, biological uh, control, um, selection of cultivars, maybe biopesticides or pesticides, and we do not know exactly which pesticides, then we will never have an agreement about the development of IPM, which, is, uh, which can be adapted to a certain uh, location and to a certain um, organism and so on. That's my concern. Oh, I get you. So this IPM is, I don't mean it's just one component. It's an integration of different strategies. It's an integration of cultural, biological, use of chemical. It's not like one-sided, like like one um, one component to mean IPM. No, yeah. I get and, you. And, and therefore uh, your um, results are, and your work is absolutely important and is uh, really a wonderful example how to uh, take all the experience of uh, people into account and to perform a very precise IPM there in your uh, situation. So very nice done. We'll have a look whether we have, we have a question from the audience. How heavily are synthetic pesticides marketed in rural communities? See, um, part of the result, maybe I did not highlight this, uh, part, of, part of the reasons why farmers had disadopted some of this technology, like the use of traps or the use of um, augmentarian for orchard plantation, they were citing is they were not readily available from the market. And so synthetic chemicals were the most readily available. So yes, the synthetic chemicals are maybe advocated for the agrochemicals, mostly advocate for synthetic pesticides. Again, farmers are concerned that um, what if I use uh, a biopesticide, will it work? So they go for the sure deal. It's like they, they are sure the chemicals will work. So, you know, they're rational, they want to minimize losses, but they don't look at the long-term effect of these pesticides. And what about the price? Uh, the price was not a determinant. They did not say that they were more more expensive. That the the IPM is more comp is more expensive. For instance, look at orchard sanitation, which is more of labor intensive than price intensive. So why would you ex you would, you would wonder why someone would not prefer using a more sustainable way to manage a uh, fruit fly, and maybe put more uh, more more labor hours than use something which is more expensive? Because when you compare the the cost of uh, Okay, sanitation versus the chemical. There is there is really no much compare. There is no can you can't compare the two. Chemicals are very expensive, but still farmers will not go for okay sanitation, saying mm -hmm. it's labor intensive. Uh, they are not sure that it will work, so they would rather go for the sure deal. So we need to send the time these farmers that uh, they should look for the external cost of the pesticides. Maybe even when the manufacturers are coming up with the cost, they should factor in the external cost of the pesticides other than the real, you know. Yes. Uh, in another section, I heard that we could try to develop a kind of citizen science approach. That means we asked, like you, uh, the people, the farmers, um, on their experiences and so on, and we asked them to collect data for us, <laughs> to collect data about their experiences to write down on the, for example, on the smartphone, which amount they yielded, which uh, kind of yield, which uh, kind of um, disease happened or pests happened and so on. And then to connect this together with you experienced scientists and uh, promote in this way more knowledge in the uh, pharmacy and then create, they called it 
farmer trainers. That means farmers who train other farmers. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this system? Yeah, it could work because the farmers can see the, the breakdown for themselves. So if they are training through their own networks. That would be could work. Yeah, and did you try it? Uh, the farmers training, like for instance, we have model farmers. We have model farmers where they, 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 they can see this farmer has used this progressively. They attend trainings. But um, I don't know what, what's up with the farmers. Mm -hmm. but they can see really this one is actually getting more more buyers like buyers will come directly to these model farmers because they are, sh they are sure their mangoes don't have pesticides but still they will go for the pesticides okay so i only want to tell you uh, charity that there are a lot of new publications on use of uh, botanicals on mango for shipping and so on very nice uh, results in the moment so Thank you very much, all of you. We heard a lot of different things about different aspects of IPM. And um, I hope you could present everything you wanted to say. If not, you have now the chance to do so. Would you like to say something to the audience? This is not the case. I can offer the audience further questions. Oh, I received in this moment some questions. A question to Charity again. How efficient are farmers in identifying disease or pests? Um, when we are doing the baseline survey, uh, we, we had a, a stack of photos, like a catalog, showing different pests, showing different diseases, and more than 90% of the farmers could clearly identify uh, pests and diseases and 100% of the farmers identified fruit fly. All of them could identify fruit fly. So we went with a stack of photos to which they could see the specific pests and diseases and they could identify them efficiently. Mm -hmm. yes. And another question for you, are farmers more income centric or yield centric? Very interesting question. Do, wow. they, do they change their crops no? because of yes. the price? Yes, they, they, there is also an observed uh, characteristic on, on, on cropping system. Like for instance, you find uh, some years before they would find coffee and tea was a very dominant uh, cash crop. Nowadays they're changing the cropping system to cut or more profitable crops. So yes, but um, on mango, not yet. They're still doing mango. Mm -hmm. And what is the rate of the behavioral change in farmers? Someone asked. How many farmers really change their behavior? From what to what? <laughs> from what to what? From, from their experience to something new? Uh, maybe from the previous, um, the previous study that was done on, on their knowledge and the, and the practices before and after, you can see there is change in use in in practices. The knowledge is there, but there is no there is a negative change in practices. So the behavior I can only comment about their knowledge and their practices. Okay, so once again, thank you very much, all of you. I thank the audience for uh, providing us with uh, questions. I hope I told, ask you everything what was written down. I would finish the uh, session now and hope to see you one year in Tropentag in life. Thank you. So, thank you very much and bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.